Hello everyone, this is Remlay from 40k Theories, and welcome to this newest episode of Adeptus Podcasters. Joining me as always is Tactica Imperialis. Hello everyone. And joining us as our special guest this week, the man who is formerly known as Rogal Dawn, but now better known as Dor from Hunt of the Parenting, Super Anchors, aka Admiral Burke, whichever one you want to go by today, we don't mind. I would rather go by either or, and I am here to redo your furniture. Yes, your favourite place in the world is Lowe's, apparently. I, I find it almost terrifying how easily you can slip into that voice, because we were talking just before the show, just casual conversation, and then hits the record button, an instant switch, no warm-up, nothing. That's right. I have a tendency to be very flexible. Really? <laughs> <laughs> There's one thing Rogal Dawn wasn't, it's flexible. Mm-hmm. You know, flexible like a cinder block, of course. Yeah, no, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to leave that one there. <laughs> there you go, Rogal like a cinder block. There we go. New tagline. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so, in the news this week, a fair bit, and I know you two wanted to talk all about the new towel guns at some point. We'll get there. Yes. We'll get there. Uh, I'm, I'm barely containing myself, Rem. There's so much here to unpack, and I can't even begin to tell you how excited I am to go on a probably way, way too long towel rant. But please, <laughs> get to your things first before I just, before well, I do I, something radical. I think the best, I'm oh, sorry. I was going to say, we could start with something tangentially towel related, because uh, I don't know if we actually discussed this last time. The new Dark Strider, did we talk about him? Um, I feel like that's a few a few episodes uh, 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 timeline wise. It's been a, it might have happened while I was off. I don't well, whilst whilst you were off and I was being disorganised. Um, <laughs> but I feel like it's been long enough. It was revealed a fair while ago the Dark Strider model. So either we talked oh, about it? it. Yeah, the, uh, they g- they gave him a lore article this week. Um, but his that's rules, probably what I'm thinking of. Yeah, okay. But his rules and his model reveal were a month or two ago now. Oh, God. bloody hell, was that? Yeah, it's been a so while. So much I blow well, take, pay attention. I blame being ill, which I'm still am, for fuck's sake. I'm sick of being sick. Oh, wow. You st- Wait, you're still sick? Yes. Oh, my gosh. I remember you. Oh. Oh. Oh, boy. Right. Yeah. Sorry. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> it happens. Ah, fuck. I'll try and edit that out now. Yeah, probably best. <laughs> no, don't, you're, don't, you're don't, fine, don't want any viewers losing their lunch. Oh, goodness. But... Yeah, the Dark Strider model is cool, though. Um, I do wish we were getting a little more in terms of model updates, like new Farsight when, but that's me being completely biased. Um, I know that. I mean, Farsight, I mean, Farsight, he's a great model right now, I think, personally. That's I'm saying that as, like, a big Tau player. I actually like his current model quite... I, quite- I, I, I agree, but also it's still resin and... Now we've seen what they can do with the commander kit, what they've done to Shadow Sun. I feel like it would be really cool to give him an update. Um, but that's not to say that he's a problem. I, if they just said, hey, we're going to redo Farsight in plastic, that would be fine. Like, they don't need to change the pose or the design or anything. Just like, tidy it up and put it in plastic would be fine. Yeah, I, I suppose that's a fair point. Um, I could see that actually giving him... Just updating everything to plastic. Can we get away from Finecast? That was a train wreck. Yeah, um, I'm actually sat with a Herald of Slanesh on my desk, one of the demons, and I bought it thinking, oh, it's one of the Heralds. Like, I, mean, I know the, the Nurgle demon's got a bunch of variations, and I know the Herald of Corn got redone, so presumably they just put this into plastic or it was always in plastic. No, it's still resin. Um, so it was like, ah, right, I need to undercoat this. I haven't undercoated it. Still, it, still, uh, it still irks me that you don't undercoat anything. It's just <laughs> long. It's Why? so... It's long. It'll take like, you five seconds to go outside with a sp- can of spray paint. What? <laughs> it's, bear in mind, it rains a lot. It's freezing cold a lot. It's That's not, of, a, that's not it's, a fair counter-argument to me, because I live in no. Florida. <laughs> it's block of flats accommodation so it's not my flat it's not anything that I own and it's a basically it's a public place essentially my outside to go spray is a public place Tack, do, do you, you have, have a balcony a park nearby? no I don't have a balcony is, what do you, do you, what do you think nearby? this is? a park? yeah just go to a park nearby it's a mile and a half away 
and I live, I work in the same town as I live and I'm a teacher. If I walk through town carrying a can of spray paint with my students around, what message do you think that's going to send? Just take what you just go and spray in a chemistry lab or something. It's not my lab. <laughs> just, say, not- just say you're using it to show like, see, this is how the molecular bonds of primer react with resin or something. It's educational, we promise. Big, big, massive winks. Like, you're, you're just blinking at this point. You're winking so much. <sighs> it's fine. <laughs> it, 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 as much as people say it looks worse, my models look fine. Like, I undercoat elven flesh because I need to um, to make to get the pale colors. I don't need to undercoat anything else. The Citadel paints are fine as a base coat onto player plastic. They're fine. I know it's lazy, but it saves me genuinely hours with the amount of models I want to paint. Like, I look at my Cities of Sigmar project, there's over a hundred infantry in it. All like, right, that's, that, listen, that's fair enough. I give, I'll give you that. Yeah. Here, I got something for you, by the way, talking about painting. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, ah, here we go. Take a look at this that I just posted in the group chat. I'm I just had this Oh printed. my. Wow. How did, how did I do? <laughs> that that's is... Bloody well, yes. <laughs> Did you say that's 3D printed? Yeah, a friend of mine printed this for me as a... Because I've, I've always wanted like a Imperial Battleship desk piece, like a model ship. And uh, he uh, printed this and I painted it. The I know that I got to touch the white up on the ram, on the prow. But other than that, how did I do? You did very well. Excellent. You did very, very well. I would say that just painting white in general is a bitch. Yeah, yeah. I, I have made it a tendency of mine to paint with the worst colors to paint with. My entire Tau army is is yellow, oh, and God. I have imperial oh. and and I have imperial fists, and I have white scars. What is it's wrong like every, with you? <laughs> every every awful hard to paint with color I have used, and it is. I'm gonna be honest. I think it's a better thing for me because it has taught me how to properly paint. By trying so desperately to avoid clumping and just, like, you know, off-shading from not layering correctly. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly a a trial by fire as to painting those sorts of colours rather than, you know, starting from colours that are more forgiving, like reds and blues and working your way up. Like, I've... I was just going to look on the bright side, at least you're not paying Lamenters. That's true. I mean, I'm close because, I mean, you know, Imperial Fists... Yeah, but at least you're not doing freehand checkerboards. Oh god, no, I I would never. That seems that seems painful to even consider. But uh, enough of that. For, yeah. <laughs> Let's talk. About, we need to talk about Tau, the important subject of the day. Well, I think it may. It's only fair. I know, obviously, a fair amount of people will know who you are from your previous appearances and things like that. But since TTS is now on indefinite hiatus, there may be a few people who are less familiar with your more recent work and what you've been doing and what Alpha's been doing. So I suppose... Yeah, that's fair if, enough. If you want to do any promo, this is your time. Um, please, everybody, go watch uh, the new uh, Hunter the Gathering. It's a wonderful series, and honestly, World of Darkness is a great, great, great universe. I am sad to see the reports from Warhammer Plus having basically killed text-to-speech for 2 million views over the course of three months. But uh, hey, wait, was it two million views or two million viewers like registered? No, two million views. Is that a slow that that, that's a slow weekend for some YouTubers? Mm -hmm. I I, I think the Astartes guy got more than that in like his first like week. Right, right. I mean, you you gotta understand. You gotta understand that is that. Go check it out. It's in the uh, it's in the uh, quarterly report. I think where it's around. It's just over two million views. Over the course of three months. That's... Uh, I'm I, honestly surprised it's that low. I, yeah, to give some I'm context... I'm genuinely surprised. Um, what's the exact name of the channel that made Astartes? Astartes. Astartes. Oh. Astartes. Right, okay. I'm gonna, I was just trying to see how many views the actual series has got. Um, but I'm trying... I'm, filters channel. Yeah, here we go. So the Astartes channel has bloody well taken down all the bloody videos off of YouTube. But the Astartes video saying it was going on to Games Workshop 
has 735,000 views. That's a third of what all of Warhammer Plus has got for a 30 second promo saying, hey, I'm going on to Warhammer Plus. Yeah. And the video, um, there's a video for Astartes, which is essentially all parts uploaded by somebody else has 10 million views. Yep. I don't know what to tell you, man. No, neither do I. I'm just pointing that out for the sake of the record. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, they 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 decided to kill text to speech for that. So, am I a little bitter? Ever so slightly. Have I not played? I mean, I had a, I mean, in the the big crusade chat that I that I run, uh, I run a big crusade group, uh, by the way. <laughs> I have not played tabletop in almost eight months, ten months, because of uh, or how however long it's been. Since they did that whole announcement where they pulled the rug out from us and Alpha came out and said, I don't want to do this anymore for safety reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't played any of my games. And I I was on this outrageous Tau winning streak in the middle of like the absolute worst time for the Tau Codex. I just put the game down because I was so, so, so tired. Yeah. But this new Tau Codex, making a transition there, away from the promo and onto Tau properly, is uh, reinvigorating my interest a little bit, mostly because it's very hard to pry me away from an army I've played since the very beginning of 4th edition. Yeah, I mean, Tau is an army I've played since mid-7th. Um, they were my last army of 7th, and the last army I started for 40k, mm-hmm. but... Um, as much as I don't have that same storied history, I've not even been playing as long as you've had Tau. Um, it's an army that, as much as I don't play it very often, because I haven't played a game of ninth apart from... I've, no, I've played two games of ninth total. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an army that I always keep an eye on now and always just keep... I, I'll always poke my head in uh, if there's something Tau-related going on. And we talked about the Railgun last time. Um, yeah, and it's please can finish. Uh, finish. I want to say something on that, but please finish first. Uh, and now we've got the storm surge to talk about, but uh, I'm sure you have a comment on the railgun. So the railgun. If I was being, if I was being, if putting myself back in like the I'm playing the game seat, right? If mm-hmm. I was being a complete, am I allowed to curse a little bit? Yes. yes okay. If are. I was being a complete asshole, um, and I was just looking to BM the shit out of somebody, I would field long strike with three hammerheads, all with railguns, against a custodies player. You can only kill three models a game or no. a per turn. You're forgetting the three mortal wounds. I'm killing two custodies every single time I fire that gun. Ah, yes. Sorry, I forgot. Damage doesn't spell, but mortal wounds do. You're right. Yes, exactly. Uh, so I'm killing two, two custodies every time one of those tanks fires its main gun. Um, so, I mean, I'm guaranteed killing four, what is that? Four bikes? Six. No, more. Th- it's assuming, six dudes. Yeah. Six dudes from the, g- eight, actually. Because Three. long strikes. And that's not even my whole army. That, that, that's not even half my army. There's still the rest of my army that's going to unload on the custodies. That's a lot of killing potential if I'm looking to BM somebody specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, I mean, it ignores involves, so it's like, if it hits and it wounds, you're instantly dead. <laughs> yep. AP um, minus five, yep. Yeah. Um, the, the Storm Surge, uh, cannon is funny to me, because it doesn't have the statistical likelihood of doing this, but... There is an ever so small chance that you can one tap a knight off the table with yes. that gun. <laughs> so, for context, the pulse blast cannon, the shotgun version of the storm surge, uh, has a profile that is two shots, strength sixteen, AP minus four, damage twelve. Uh, but notably, it does not in- ignore the invulnerable saves or do mortal wounds, as far as we are aware. So, That's not entirely correct, because there's a stratagem for 2CP, which allows that thing to ignore involves. Okay, fair enough. But, yes, if it connects at full stack, it is 24 damage. 
Um, but if you have a two-up save, you do have a chance to protect against it. If you are toughness nine or above, it does not wound you on twos. It only, only has a 24-inch range, and I know that's still a lot, but it's... In the grand scheme of Tau, it's a pretty limited range. And if a knight gets within 24 inches and can stand behind cover for one turn, the Storm Surge is then toast. Right. I mean, again, it's 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 one of those situations where on paper it looks absolutely ridiculous. But on the field, the play will be significantly different. But it's it's going to lead to, I think, some very funny moments where a guy like has a crazy game where he fields two, three storm surges against a knight player, and then he one taps every single turn, all three shots. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think I made a comment last episode that I was worried Tau, whilst they may not be the best army going, I don't know because I'm not qualified. We haven't seen the points. We haven't seen the rest of the book. They're... I'm worried that... Go ahead, finish first, sorry. I'm just worried they're going to be really unfun for casuals. Like, they're, they're going to turn up, camp, blast you off the board, thanks for coming, you didn't roll an attack dice. I disagree, and I, I agree and disagree, only because from what I've seen based on a couple previews, not that I, I'm, not, I'm not Games Workshop tester or anything, but from things mm-hmm. that I've seen through aggressive, that crusade group hunting them down for me, um, the Tau look like they're going to be in a position to be dynamically interesting and fun to engage on all fronts and also not be hamstrung so, so heavily when a melee army contacts them. Like, they have the opportunity to 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 play the game now, but I think that they're going to suffer from the Drakari thing. So if we're going we're gonna to see two months of just absolute screaming, anger, and just people upset that you know, this codex is so overpowered and blah, blah, blah. Oh, the tower back at it, back at it again. Um, yeah, because that always happens. What was it? Fourth edition, fifth edition, seventh edition, uh, kind of sixth edition with the with the, the flyers. Um, and the Riptide. Yeah, eighth edition with the Triptide. Um, it was sixth seventh... edition, the Triptide. Riptide wing was sixth and seventh. No, Triptide was eighth too, wasn't it? Well, the Riptide wing detachment was seventh. Um but, but Tower was, was introduced also, in sixth. Tower was also seventh, though, wasn't it? And sixth, because both codices were introduced in sixth and not updated, so they just stayed being busted. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah sorry. Uh, but uh, just every edition, the Tower have always been on the receiving end of some like the Tower just so overpowered because they're such a different you know play style. They don't engage. Okay, that that you guys say this every single time. And then the Tau end up getting nerfed or other codexes come out, which put the Tau in such a bad position that everybody feels bad for the Tau. And then the Tau's new codex comes out and then everybody cries and screams that the Tau are overpowered. Mm. You know, it's, it's cyclical. It, it, it's, that's just how it is every single time. I, what I'm going to say is that in two to three months, the nerfs will come out. Tau will become an above average army. Um, they'll probably be around or just under admix strength. Is where I would where I would put them based on the things I've seen. Yeah, I it, I personally sorry. am looking forward to seeing dynamic battle suit play, but I also feel very weird Tau armies. Like for example, my upcoming army that I'm planning on making is exclusively stealth suits and ghost keels. Fun, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I'm not worried about them on a competitive sense, like. Drakari being one of the best armies in the game will be able to bomb rush them with the cover system and the amount of cover that's now provided. I think Drakari will be able to bomb rush and deal with them relatively fine. I still think things like Death Guard might be able, an Admech and things like that might be able to manage. My worry is not comp, it's casual. Um, and that's where a lot of the anger often comes from. Um, because I, people see that, oh, this army is pretty good at top tier, but whoa. in... Sorry, please finish. No, it, it's like, at top tier, yeah, it probably will be fine, especially with Gene Steel the Cult ambushes and all their rules and Drakari face rush and orcs being able to still d- deal all right with buggies and flyers and etc. I'm not worried about them, like, dominating the top tables more than one tournament after they come out. Like, first one, they might sweep because no one's used to playing them, but give it, like, a month and they'll be fine. My worry is 
where Tau are so dangerous is in casual play, where their guns are so powerful that if you don't know how to play around them, or you are less experienced with the systems, or your army is not built to deal with it, they can blow you off the board. I luckily never had that experience because I played aggro farsight wing always, but I saw so many times in 8th edition going around my local store of like, here is 30 fire warriors, triple riptide, triple hammerhead, ethereals, fireblades, and four buff commanders whizzing around where... That sounds, like a, that sounds like a 4K army you just said, you just posted. Yeah, it might, it might not have been quite that, but like, that those were the units, like Fireblade, Ethereal, Fire Warriors, Riptide, Hammerhead, maybe a Devilfish, maybe Battlesuits, that sat there, walked up the board if it had to, and blew you away. And you had, unless you really knew what you were doing, you had no counter to it. Well, I mean, Tau... Okay, so... First things first, I wanted to say this. Um, a lot of the Tau's frustration gimmicks that they've had from the past, they've been kind of relegated into stratagems. Like, there's a stratagem, I think, that I read where you can hop out of a Devilfish transport after it moves, and that 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 seems like a reference to the old... Um, uh, what was it? The, the, the Devilfish bunker thing? The... <laughs> Which I thought was Sorry, very funny. Sorry, you completely cut out. I didn't hear a word of that. Sorry. Um, the A lot of things, frustration things that the Tau have seen in the past looks like they're being relegated into stratagems. There's also a lot of points, barricades for single stacking weapon systems on battlesuits. And mm. I mean, the other thing is like to play Tau is a little more difficult as well, I, I feel, just because you have relegated everything into two phases, your positioning and your shooting. Yep. And if your positioning's bad, you can't shoot. Uh, and it, But if your positioning's good and your shooting's bad, um, oh, hello, Rem, you'll, you'll lose. Like, yep. tower, tower one of those armies where I can see where people will be very frustrated trying to fight them, but I think that they've counterbalanced that quite heavily in this edition, uh, Tactica, because what they've done is they're with Motka, for example, they're encouraging you to get your ass closer to the enemy. And yep. then Ka Kayun, they're encouraging you, I think, what, to, to, to back away from your enemy. Yeah, stay back, and then you get the benefits if you can stay alive long enough. Right. So, But Motka encourages you to really close the gap to those armies that potentially are more melee-focused. So it's like, it, it's kind of basically, by mechanics you know, dragging you towards the enemy because you you really, if you want to get that extra AP, you want to get closer. And for big melee armies, a lot of the time, those these ultra scary weapons like the, the railgun and the blast cannon and all that, they, in reality, aren't going to stop a big marine melee ball. You know, sure, they're scary and you'll clip maybe one or once, one squad, two squads, but the rest of the Space Marine Army is going to impact you and rip you your butt open. Mm, absolutely. I mean, AP minus two triple tapping pulse weapons might want a word. Uh, and you're but you're absolutely right. And I don't disagree with anything you've said. I just, from experience, have been on the wrong end of, as a Tau player, like, oh, you're playing Tau, you super massive power gamer, and stuff, because people either did, couldn't learn, didn't learn, or were unable to work out a way to deal with the simple camp in a corner gun line blast you into next week. Well, but Ninth I mean, Edition is well set up to counter it. The objective yeah. play is better for it. The cover system is better for it. Uh, everything I'm saying, I've not played Ninth enough to say this for sure, but when you see guns that can delete an entire nid monstrous creature in one shot ignoring every single save they get and when you see guns that can one shot a knight semi consistently if you can reliably hit and wound it makes you think oh no if these are consistent enough and they are cheap enough to be run there are going to be a lot of people who are very unhappy and as you say that anger will come out it will be tempered absolutely but I worry that it's going to lead them getting that bad rep again. 
Well, again, I mean, my, my core philosophy is that Ninth Edition has always been, or, or it really has evolved into a game of extraordinary positioning. Um, it, it's an addition of maneuver, not so much an addition of killing, to me personally, because the killing is easy. And it can be kind of work, it, you can worm out the killing, work it out in any edition. The killing is easy to obtain. Ninth, to me, has always been about positioning, not even objective play, because if you position correctly, you can execute the enemy armies, uh, you, you can kneecap them in a single round or a single turn. And that's kind of how I, I personally want the edition to be played, because if I am outmaneuvered, I will get my ass handed to me, and vice versa. Yep. Um, and the thing is, having those big, slow, campy gun corners uh, does not work with that particular playstyle, which is why... I mean, my my prized go-to army for Tau was double Yavara, three units of five-man stealth suits, two ghost keels, and uh, two cold star commanders with quad fusion blasters. And Oof. that army is fast as hell. Yeah. Uh, for, for a non-vehicle army, right? Yeah. So it's like, I have the ability with that army to pick and choose what things I'm going to kill and if I deliberately go second as Tau, which is very unusual for, you know, earlier in this edition, mm -hmm. I let the army walk up the table, they get closer to me, and as they get closer to me, great, you have now put yourself in a position where I have the full control over what I am about to kill. Yeah. Again, maneuver. I, I personally feel maneuver is the key to this edition. Yeah. And, uh, uh, go ahead. No, no, I was, I was just going yes and. Just let and, carry on. Sorry, I was kind of going off on a semi-related tangent there. Um, no, it's fine. But uh, with, with the new Tau Codex, a lot of the stratagems and faction abilities and stuff like that kind of kind of seemed keen on reinforcing that, right? Like, the Ghost Keel, I know for a fact, cannot be shot if it's more than 18 inches away from, from the enemy. Um, stealth Suits, get, they get plus one to their save if they're in cover. So, one-up Stealth Suits... You know, one up armor say stealth suits that are minus one to hit always. And the word always is in there, by the way. Yep. So I mean, I, I think positioning, maneuver, and all these other things, like like you said, the cover system makes this and um the objective system makes this makes it so that you really want to play towards those more. And I think that a lot of the I mean your concerns your your I think I feel like the initial concerns you have here are valid, but I don't think they will kind of stick long term. No, I mean, I'm talking as the filthiest casual. I'm fully aware I'm talking as the filthiest casual who played on boards that didn't have enough cover. Like we never had enough terrain realistically to play a game where the cover was relevant beside a little bit of LOS blocking. There was never enough of it. And it made your list, your list even more... Like, it was annoying, but it was beatable. Uh, not well. Okay, it wasn't beatable because I know I know I have no idea how to beat it. But yeah, I think I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure I'm wrong because I don't have the experience. That's just my. I look at the numbers and I look at the big scary numbers and I go, "Oh boy, there's going to be some salt about this." That's all. I mean, again, single shot, big damage weapons. That's kind of the modus operandi for this thing. I mean, we have we have so many. I mean, the Marines have, have face, like, what, what is it? Uh, face Masher or whatever the chapter Captain masters. Smash Hammer. Captain Smash Hammer came back with a vengeance this edition. Or, yeah, Smash Master came back with a vengeance with his, with his co-pilot Smash Captain. Uh, <laughs> they're back and definitely in full force. Um, there's a lot of individual high-hitting, hard-hitting units, like these, these champion units or champion weapons that kind of come out. And they'll delete one thing, and then they potentially are super overexposed. But a lot of mm. people don't play around that. They 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 don't. I don't know how to. It's it's kind of difficult to to. I it, guess. It's hard to show without a gaming table in front of you. Yeah. Yes, I exactly. Um, I mean, a lot of people don't really consider their positioning in a lot in in a lot of the games that I have played in in Ninth Edition. They they consider where they're going to shoot. They consider um what objectives they're on but they don't consider a lot of the times 
where the enemy potentially can move, and where if in two turns, if the enemy does this, I will be positioned here to counter that. Yeah. And that's, I think that's, I think that's the general problem with fighting Tau, even with its current codex. Um, if a good Tau player knows how to, you know, like, is super aggressive with his positioning, even with the kind of shit hand he has right now, I think they can give you a pretty painful run for your money. Mm. Um, but I think in the future, in the upcoming edition, um, I think a lot of the salt, honestly, Tactica is going to come from a lot of the old things that made people really upset being turned into stratagems. Like, again, jumping out of a devilfish after it moves. Could you imagine um, jump, jumping shoot, out jump. of a devilfish? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Jump, shoot, jump is back. Um, what else? Um, twin linked on the turn you arrive from Deep Strike. Yes. There's that. And the counterfire defense system that turns the enemy's super ultra massive gun into damage one. Yes. Yes. It's all these things. I think those are, these are all the, the really frustrating things that'll exist uh, for enemy players, people fighting Tau. I don't think that we should worry too much though after like the first month. Cause I mean, like all codexes, it's going to get picked apart and you know, sorry, I guess I cut out there, but we shouldn't worry after the first month or two because, again, the nerfs will come out and the codex is going to get picked apart. Mm. Yeah, so. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see exactly how it shakes out. I think you've pro- you've definitely got the better read on things than me. I my, my knowledge is just so behind because living on your own and having most of your friends in the next county means that you don't really get a chance to go and play much. So I'm I'm miles behind the times. That's all. And I know tabletop sim exists. I know. I mean, uh, I was going to say, time. if you want, you could here. I'll send you an invite to my crusade server. We have three hundred something people all playing in this crusade. We have it's a big sector map. All this fun stuff. Lots of lore. Mm. Lots of stories. You're a writer, right? You like that kind of thing? It's cool. It's just time. And I, I mean, I work. I, I mean, teachers are contracted 35 hours a week. Most of us work more like 70 or 80. So mm. it's, it's, it's just long. I, everything you're saying is correct. And I will join that server, I suspect, I'll, I'll, if I get a chance later. Uh, but I cannot promise I will ever, ever be active because I've just got so much to do. Um, oh, no, dude, trust me. You, you don't have to, you, you don't need to play. Just, just talk to the people about what's going on. Cause a lot of these guys are, are meta analysts. Fair enough. Yeah, I suppose that helps when you've got people around you who understand the game. And I remember back in the old days, me and Alexis used to not butt heads, but we used to discuss a lot about meta things. And it was always just, okay, this is the meta viewpoint. This is me be this is tactic of being a moron. So don't worry, I'm used to being wrong. So then it's fine. <sighs> right, that was a very, very long rant about Tao. We've been going over half an hour already. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. Jesus Jesus <laughs> so, whoa, whoa, sorry about that. Sorry, did, no, I, did, it's, did we talk too much about Tao? We're supposed no, to- no, it's fine. It's fine. It, it's good. It's good to have someone on the show who does follow competitive play and actually understands the game on a deeper level than just a filthy casual. Uh, because Rem and I don't get a chance to play much, if at all, and we haven't got the experience, especially in ninth at least to comment on how the game is played and what works um, aside from what we see in things like meta watch articles and what we see on people's social medias. Mm. Oh my God. Hang on. I'm reading a couple of things right now. I'm going through that, that, that leak thread I sent you Rem. A couple upgrades just for people listening um, for battle suits. This one really grabbed my attention. Target lock. The old target lock, it was um, you don't suffer the penalty for moving with a heavy weapon, uh, which or kind of running became... with an assault weapon as well. Was that right? I something like that. Uh, point is, it, it became effectively useless with the new rulebook that came out, saying that all, the only people who suffer from that are infantry units. So battle suits, this was actually worthless. On um, the new target lock, this model ignores light cover. Oh, ouch. <laughs> Uh, multi-tracker. Six is to hit score an additional hit for ranged attacks targeting units containing six or more models. Oh, uh, exploding sixes on things like upgraded burst cannons and plasma rifles. Ow. Uh-huh. And fusion, of course. 
Uh huh. Early warning override. Five plus Overwatch for this model. The Overwatch stratagem costs one less CP when used for this unit. Also, that's free. Does yeah, that means it's free. Yeah, you yeah. just don't use it once, but it's free. Yep. Okay, well, you can no longer use early warning override to pre-fire people deep striking near you, which is what, which was the thing I did to make these enormous exclusion zones around my uh these huge exclusion zones around my Yavaras. Yeah, early warning override plus um, the ability, like uh, particularly with flyers, when you had uh, velocity trackers as well, so you could avoid the snap, some of the snap fire penalties uh, with broadside rail cannons was just like oof. Oh no, dude! I'm talking early warning override with Borkan on a Yavara with the two damage uh, before they nerfed it. Um, that is oh, yeah. a that is a auto hitting strength seven flamer. I think it is. It's no, I, I've I've been hit by a Yavara precisely once, and it scarred me to the point that I still want one. So uh, I know how powerful the Yavara was. I have it. Be, Due to Crusade rules, so Crusade's a whole different dimension, but uh, I got the plus one damage to the Flamer on my um, <laughs> on my uh, Yavara, and through a series of really lucky rolls, I was able to wipe out an entire unit of Alaris Terminators that deep struck, uh, deep struck near a Yavara. Jesus. Uh, sorry, do I keep cutting out? Uh, I can mostly follow you, it's fine. Okay. Uh, sorry, we should probably stop talking so much about Tau. What else is on the agenda, Rem? <laughs> Well, um, what was it? The fucking bloody well funny thing. Um, <laughs> the star collectings. I was going to say that um, the Order of the Bloody Rose are getting a codex supplement. Yeah, this is inside Vigilus alone, I believe. It is, yes. Um, so what does it do? Um, their Paragon war suits get to get exploding six, ex- exploding fours. On the turn, they charge into big units with Paragon War Suits. That's fun. Um, and their core units get to attack when they die, um, which is including in the shooting phase, which is pretty funny. Basically, very angry sisters of battle. Yeah, and armor that says a two up save, and every time you lose a wound, you get a miracle dice. Which is what they use for their um, acts of faith and things. Is it per? Is it every single wound in total, or is it just when once you lose? per phase? Once uh, you lose a wound, so yeah. if you get one shot, then you get one miracle dice. If you take one wound a phase, what shooting wound, melee wound, psychic wound, shooting wound, melee wound, then yeah, then it stacks up. Did we also talk about? Um, we talked about the new out up model, didn't we? Um, we talked about Eldritch Omens, the box, uh, but we got a deeper look at the Altart box more recently. Um, so now we know everything it comes with. It looks very customizable because you like you now you give them like a web spinner, shuriken pistol, fusion gun, chainsword. You can also give them a warp jump generator as well. Mm, yeah, mm. you can. So yeah, you get two melee options, Star Glaive or Scorpion Chainsword, and then Shuriken Pistol, Reaper Launcher, uh, Fusion Gun or Death Spinner, uh, and it does come with the Warp Jump option. And they do, as mentioned previously, have full cross compatibility with the current Outart kit, which comes with things like Fusion Pistols, Wings, Power Swords, Mad and the blasters, like. yeah. Yeah. So you, you basically can use this to get every other weapon option. Uh, for an Altarc, there will be no weapon option you cannot take. How long has it been since we actually had um, Warp Jump Altarcs? As a model? Or in rules? In rules, I think someone said this is the first time we've had one back in ages, so I think I remember seeing someone say on Twitter. Um, the last time I looked at an Eldari Codex was 6th edition, so I have absolutely no idea. Fair enough. <laughs> But the fact you got all these options, it makes it like... I think we actually see it, you know, more like this for other, you know, commander kits in the future. Like, this this huge level of customization. Yeah, like, the Space Marine Cap t- commander kit, the Tau commander kit, um, but, like, and even, like, the Chaos Lord. Um, I've got a Chaos Lord in Terminator armor, and... I just grab its box. What weapon options does that come with? Because it's quite a few. It's like it Lightning Claw, a- isn't it? Um, so base default, you've got the axe, uh, combi melter, you've got a chain fist, combi bolter, you've got the sorcerer options as well. 
uh, for the sorcerer's staff. Um, what other weapons do you have? Is it just axe and chain fist, or do you have other options? Oh, and a lightning claw as well. Um, so, yeah, lightning claw, uh, combi melter, combi bolter, and then chain fist, lightning claw, power fist, and power axe, and force stave. They're the options that the Terminator Lord kit comes with for Chaos. But that's an old kit. Because what is the current... Um, because I don't think the Space Room one actually has that much um, in general, does it? No, there's just a million different variations. Yeah. So you want, you want a different variation, you go buy a different model kind of thing. As far as I'm aware, particularly with Gravis Captains, then yeah, you kind of just have to buy the kit that's relevant. Which is a bit of a bummer. Agreed, but at least it's not as bad as Orc War Bosses. I, it got so bad, they took half the weapon options off the Orc War Boss, and the only plastic War Boss in non-Mega Armor you can buy is still Gruck Face Ripper. Really? In plastic, yeah. There's the Mega Armor one, and there's Gruck Face Ripper. Fair enough, then. Uh, but there was some brand new Eldari we got to see this week. Was it? Guardians. Oh, yeah, the Plastic Guardians I'll be, got released. I'll be honest, I, I completely forgot about them. Yeah, I mean, I had to scroll down to find them, but yes, there's a new Guardian Defender stroke Storm Guardian kit, uh, which comes with a new um, shield-based weapon platform. So clearly the Eldar have been taking notes off the Tau and their barrier drone and decided to nick the idea for their Serpent Scale platform. So I have one question right off the bat. Why do they feel the need to sculpt a belly button in for the female torso? You know, we really got to appeal to what matters, man. I mean, if you, if you feel nipples on Blood Angel's arm was bad. <laughs> but I, 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 I am going to be honest, I had not even noticed. Because like the, the, like the male one, the male one does, doesn't have a belly button, but the female one does. Yeah, the male one has abs. abs that, yeah. <laughs> It's just like, <sighs> how thirsty were you? You know, you need some water. <laughs> kind of thing. But still, considering what how old the Eldari Guardian, the Eldar Guardians kit was, it is a faithful, but still a very good update, I would say, to the kit. Now, the question is, what's going to get updated next? The Corn Berserkers or the Catachan Jungle Fires? Leave the uh, Catachan hopefully... looking like squares, please. <laughs> I mean, hopefully, Chaos finally gets a proper update um, alongside its new codex, which may include Plastic Corn Berserkers. Who knows? Do you know what? I'm hoping we actually get um, some updated Warp Spiders, because we're still using the second edition models. Oof. Yeah, um, I, I, this is a leak, but someone posted in my Discord server what looks to be a new model for Shining Spears. I'm not going to say any more than that, because obviously it's not official. But take it with a pinch of salt, basically. Yeah, but it looks like the corner art for a codex of a shining spear. So it's something that they are looking at more than just doing the core Eldari range. We know they've done rangers, they've got those new ranger jet bikes, we've got guardians, we've got Altark, um, and Malgan Ra and the Avatar on its way. Malgan Ra and the Avatar. So we know they're looking at the aspect warriors as well. So we'll see exactly how far this range goes, but. In terms of like size of update, this is probably going to be the biggest update to a range since possibly the Primaris. Like I know Admech got a bunch of stuff, but that's because they were a new army. Custodes were a new army. GC the Cults were a new army. I mean, in fairness, like if anyone needed a range update, it was the Craft World. Let's be bloody honest. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because like, yeah. like Drukari got a complete range update in like fifth, didn't they? Yep. Every single model got redone in 5th, except Drazhar. He got updated in 7th. Yes. What was no, 8th. 8th, yes. It was 8th. I keep forgetting Blood of the Phoenix was 8th edition. Psychic Awakening, yeah, not Gathering Storm. Yeah. With his but, yeah. giant head and tiny arms. But, I mean, we've had a pretty comprehensive revamp to the Orcs range. The the Drakari is... I'll be honest, with, like the new Orc boys, I'm not as keen on them as I am with the older ones. I've been on two separate rants about that Orc Boys kit, the fact it's push fit and all that lark, and you know it's bad because GW haven't even retired the old kit. I mean, I just think the old kit was just, it just looked better personally, it seemed more orky. The, the new ones just seemed, new ones just seemed too clean. 
Yeah, the problem with the old Orc Boys kit was the way that the legs and torso were designed is that if you did it, it was very easy to make them look like they were basically just bent, like not just like hunched, but like Arching full blown bags, bent yeah. over. Yeah. Um, which was something that annoyed me a bit. Like, these new boys look more natural in terms of posing. Are their um, aesthetics but, too clean for it and too neat to be orky? Uh, I mean, the armor's plenty dented. The shirts are plenty ripped. There's scars all over them. But I think it's partly down to paint job as well, that it they're very be. cleanly I'll, painted. I'll, I'll, I'll willingly admit that it could just be down to paint job, yeah. Yeah, um, but maybe I'm... I mean, I've got the Beast Snaggers and the new boys side by side, um, both painted. And admittedly, I know the difference but it's not a huge difference. And admittedly, I haven't got any of my old boys next to them, but certainly I didn't feel like it was a complete betrayal to the design of the boys' kit in terms of their cleanliness. It was a betrayal to the design of the boys' kit and that it had no customizability. Mm. That's that's what did me in. Fair enough. Mm-hmm. But uh, that's a rant I've been on twice before, so I'm not going to. I'm, I'm not going to do it again. What else has been news then? Uh, Gene Steeler Cults and Adeptus Custodes are now out. They are on shelves. Yeah, I got uh, mine to hand. They came today. Yep. Yeah. yeah um, and we got a look during the last week or so at the new Brood Brothers rules, uh, the introduction of Captain Commanders, um, so the bosses of Shield Captains. Um, some stratagems, uh, a, a look at the new industrial weapons, which is something we were talking about last time in terms of how good they must be in law. Well, we've got to look at how they are in game now. Um, and this week's pre-orders are Fury of the Deep, um, so the Ideneth and Fire Slayers box, as well as Necron and Eldari aircraft for Aeronautica Imperialis. Going back to the uh, Custodian Codex uh, briefly, um, mm-hmm. there is something that I had a very quick skim through, and there is something that seems very interesting um, Go on. When, it's, when it's talking about um, the hallowed vaults. Um, so the vaults not only hold artifacts and relics, however, they also hold beings. It that craves subject 11 and one of the fell are but a handful of thousands. Right, you're going to need to put that into context for people like me and the rest of us. Well, let's put it this way. The Hallowed Vaults are beneath the Imperial Palace. Subject 11. Why is the number 11 significant when it comes to the Imperial Palace? Ah. Ah. Yeah, Yeah, my brain just caught up. Subject 11, you say? Subject 11, yes. Ah, hmm. Big think. And there's also, you know, now when you go back and think about that short story where Rogal Dawn found, you know, those two chambers marked 2 and 11 beneath the Imperial Palace. Mm-hmm. Mm. Rogal Dorn also, like, willingly was lobotomized by Malkador. Like, he straight up told Malkador to lobotomize him. Well, it wasn't so much lobotomized, it just wiped my memory of this. Well, same thing. I mean, if Rogal Dawn was lobotomized, like, I, uh... Well, you know... And then just fall over. They had pulled the pulled the memories out of his head, My of uh, of his brothers. Yeah, and then he learned the horrible truth after Malkador during the siege told him the horrible truth, and was like, "Damn, I am so glad they are not out and about. They would have just sided with Horus." Now wipe my memory again. <laughs> we can't have any continuity errors. <laughs> Oh god, I, I just noticed that I have so many peaks on my audio recording in Audacity. I really hope it's not like this loud, cackling burst nightmare. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put a limiter on it, don't worry. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, you mentioned something to me as well about the whole Gene Steeler Cult terror thing in terms of like... Yeah, um, so good news. They've not retconned the Worms of the Earth Tendril storyline. Um, what they've done is that they've said, hey, guess what? There's two Gene Steeler cults in Terra because the one from the Shadowfern box set was the Pauper Princes, not the Air Tendril. So, mm. yeah, two, well, multiple Gene Steeler cults operating on Terra at the same time. Unsurprising, but also slightly surprising. It makes me think, like, how the fuck is Terra you know, still functioning? It's like, so you've got multiple Gene Steeler cults. We had that instant with the rogue Drukari homunculus and his army of grotesques. You know, 
You had uh, demonic had, incursion. <laughs> yeah, the big eighty-eight. Uh, what is it? The eight legions, eight whole legions coming in. The eight legions eight. of corn. Yeah. Yeah, eight legions of corn attacked her. How many? Didn't corn basically just attack everything? Nurgle attacked Ultramar. Where did Slanesh and Zeech attack? Um, Zinch uh, ended up attacking Nurgle's world because it's like, now I'm getting sick of Nurgle getting all the glory. I'm going to take it from him. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, Slanesh yeah. kind of took a back seat because they were too busy pushing Magnus and Morty. I was going to say, mm. Slanesh was busy being, you know, captured by, you know, the Elven Pantheon. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true, yeah. Uh. <laughs> uh, Age of Sagma. <laughs> it's, called, it's called consolidating the facts. <laughs> right. But yeah, um, it makes me feel like like you know all those incidents happen basically within like you know about a week of each other. You know, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm being hyperbolic when I say that, but even so, it's like all this shit happening within rapid succession. Oh, and let's not forget, you know, um, when the Minotaurs had that big punch up with you know the Imperial fists and the Custodians on Terra as well. <laughs> I think what they're trying to get across is that maybe it's not that Terra is still functional; it's that Terra is just so vast and so sprawling and so dense that it's kind of like like in the Dread comics where there's so much that what we would consider to be a genocide or a catastrophe is just a random daily occurrence. I was just going to say, basically terrorists like, you know, the galactic equivalent of the Red Hook section of Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah, that's really funny. But yeah, I think it's more that Terran bureaucracy doesn't rely on Terra actually functioning at all. Like, a trillion Terrans can die, and it will make absolutely no difference. I mean, in fact, as you can say, that's just the Imperium. The Imperial bureaucracy is only effective because it's not effective at all, and it only keeps going because of momentum. Yeah, it's like a man with his head cut off who doesn't realise he's already dead. Omaiwaimo, shinderu, nani? We had, to in, we had to put that in somewhere. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, there were also five, uh, speaking of armies like Genes of the Cults and Custodes, there were five combat patrols revealed this week, including the Custodes and Gene Stealer Cults and the Tau. So, mm. the, so the Custodes get 18 miniatures, um, five Custodians, 10 Sisters of Silence, and three Jet Bikes. Uh, the Gene Stealer Cults get 10 Neophytes, 10 Acolytes, 6 Aberrants, a Rock Grinder, uh, a Magus, and some other bits. I may have miscounted, so it might be 15 they, or something. Have they got Metamorphs in there, it looks like? It might be, yeah, 5 Metamorphs, yeah. Uh, that's why I might be mis miscounting, yeah. Um, the Grey Knights and Thousand Sons, remember they had a battle box, guys. Uh, they get start collecting with uh, a Dread Knight, five Terminators, and a Librarian, and a five-man strike squad, or Interceptor, oh, or whatever. It's, it's not adding Castle and Crow, then? Uh, you don't generally put named characters in these kinds of boxes. Well, wasn't it a start collecting box that had Araman in it, though? Uh, it could be made as Araman, yes, but it wasn't canonically Araman, I believe. It was an Exalted Sorcerer. And wasn't the Death Watch one, didn't it also have Captain Artemis in it? Maybe. <laughs> okay, rule of thumb, but, um, exceptions of rule, etc. Um, my, my point being, because the, the combat patrol for the Grey Knights and the Thousand Suns is literally just their forces from that, you know, their box set. We had them fighting, except Castle and Crow is not in it now, even though he was yeah, in the box set. Yeah, because it's it's twenty Zangors, five Scarab Occult, and the uh, I want to say Master of Fates, but I know it's wrong. Uh, character. I've seen a lot of people say that the new Thousand Suns start collecting bo well combat patrol box is actually worse than the last one. I mean, it doesn't have any rubric marines in it. Exactly, you got like twice as many Zangor and like no rubric. <laughs> How many Zangors do you want? None. Ah, all the Zangors. The entire box is now Zangors. It pretty much is, because there's like 26 miniatures and 20 of them are Zangor. And, and here's another Araman to round out your fifth Araman. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Tau box is Anchor's favourite thing ever. It's an ethereal, a fireblade, ten fire warriors, stealth suits, and a ghost kill. Ah, oh, my favourite. I don't like fire warriors, actually, so much. I actually just really, really, really like stealth suits. I would say it's the Tau combat patrol actually looks pretty decent. 
Inverno. It's a very different direction to take them because the last time they had a box, it was the ethereal uh, crisis suits and fire warriors. Um, so this is a, a different direction to take them. Also, it kind of suggests we're getting a plastic fire blade um, or the fire. It's the same model, but you wouldn't put a resin model inside of uh, a combat patrol. And I'm pretty sure that the fire blade is still resin. I'm willing to be wrong there because I don't own one, but I mean. Knowing GW, I wouldn't put it past them to like do stuff because there were instances back in the day we'd have like um like box sets that'd be like mostly plastic, but then you have like random like a random blister pack with metal bits on it. So so I wouldn't put it past them in fairness. Mm, maybe. I mean, yeah, go against their new, their new you know current philosophy, but even so, it's not without precedent. So no, that's true. There is precedent, but it's a good box. I do think it's a good box. It's just a shame I already own six stealth suits and two ghost kills and 45 worries because I have no interest in buying it. Mm-hmm. Stealth suits are great. <laughs> I'm going to keep saying yeah. it. I just use them as basically it's a bit of fire support and teleport homer fodder. That's what I've normally used them for because I prefer to play Crisis. Sir, have you considered the six shot burst cannon? I mean, this was in the days of the four shot burst cannon. Now the six shot burst cannon is a lot better. I agree. Um, and this whole one plus armor save thing you mentioned. I, I really wonder if they're going to keep the custom sets, because if they do, I'm putting an advanced targeting system with the burst cannon sept on. So I have uh, AP uh, strength five, AP two, six shot burst cannons. And then you apply Mont Ka. <laughs> yeah, and then I Mont Ka after infiltrating at the beginning of the game. So I'm already in critical AP range. So it's actually strength five, AP three. Yeah. <laughs> Do you see now why I'm playing stealth suits? Oh, it's unfriendly. It's really unfriendly. It's totally friendly. I could completely botch the uh, the the initiative roll. And then you don't care because you have minus one to hit and a one plus armor save. <laughs> listen. Listen. Also, don't you do infiltrators after you roll for turn? Uh, I, Isn't it like, like the last thing you do? I... Don't think so. I think you're supposed to deploy them after you do standard deployment. Yeah, I'm willing to be wrong. I, I forget. It's no, it's after something, but before something else, and I forget exactly what sequencing is. Um, it's been a while. I don't know. Well, I'll have to look that up. I haven't played it in a little while, so I'm actually falling off the cliff in terms of knowledge on I that. I think it, I think you might be right that it's after all units have been deployed, but before the first player takes their first turn. Mm -hmm. You set them up, um, I think, uh, or something like that. I forget. Mm -hmm. Or was that just the 5th edition rules and I'm just completely out of date? I might be too. Anyway. Yeah. I do. Um, I've said my piece on the Achillean Thrallmaster. I do really like that box. And we've actually had a look at their rules today because uh, obviously the War Scrolls have come out. And oh my God, Namati looks so fun now. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm really looking forward to um, to getting a thrall master eventually, and uh, giving my Ideneth another run out now that thralls have got uh, two inch range on their melee weapons, and whisper bows now are just more consistent all the time. It's uh, it's quite fun, but uh, ah, that can wait. Um, coming back to Vigilus alone, there's going to be a new army of renown in there for uh, basically if you want to play all vanguards, you get a unique army. Oh yes, the uh, not Raven Guard army. The not Raven Guard army. Because like pretty I mean, much everything about them is like it seems like they wanted special rules for Raven Guard and like hang on, let's make it available for everyone. Because like, haven't they got like a special artifact like the Umbral Armor, which is basically let's be honest, it's a fucking Raven Guard artifact in all but name. Yeah, it's called the Armor Umbral. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, makes the wearer's masking the wearer's presence with the sigh of the wind and the rustle of vegetation. That's, uh, that's a Raven Guard relic in all but name. You can't convince me otherwise. Yeah, you get run and charge, and you can't be hit on anything less than a 4+. plus. <laughs> also, you get saboteurs, marksman targeting, and morbidus bolts, which are... Uh, you, get, you turn your bolt weapon into it's a single shot, but if you hit, you do two mortal wounds flat and take one off their combat attrition rolls. I don't know if that's any good, but it's, it's, it's a relic. 
What else do we got on the table? So we got the custodies, we got the gene sealer cults, we got the Tau, we got the Elder, what else? Uh, in terms of 40k, we've pretty much covered everything, which is a lot for two weeks. It should be said, that's a lot for two weeks uh, of just 40k stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, Blood Bowl is getting star players for goblins, including a guy with a literal bomb and a fanatic, which is fun. Uh, I've mentioned the new flyers for Aeronautica for Eldar and Necrons. It'll be interesting to see if the Eldar ones in particular make it to the new Codex. Uh, because there's this thing called the Vampire Raider, which is able to carry jump troops. So Eldar are going to be given a transport flyer. Isn't that already available on Forge World, the Vampire? Um, I have no idea. Uh, there's two variants. There's the Hunter, which is a bomber, and the Raider, which is a transport. So I don't know if they're already on Forge World or if only one variant is. Let me have a look. Um, it takes forever to do anything with Forge World because uh, just going onto the site, you need to enter a fucking capture, which is stupid. If you, me, if you want me to enter a fucking capture, let me do it at the fucking checkout, not when I'm trying to access the fucking site. Let's see what they got. Uh, oh no, it's not on there. I swear it was on there at one point. Yeah, because the only uh, Eldar stuff on Forge World, you got the um, Shadow Spectres, Phantom Titan, Revenant Titan. Cobra, Scorpion, Wraith Knight, Tantalus, Lynx, Nightwing, Avatar, Warp Hunter, Reaper, and Hornet. And Rapeseer. Yeah. Yeah. The Nightwings were already in Aeronautica. These vampires seem to be new. I swear that they've been in models of them before. I swear they have. Maybe. And it's actually available in Games Workshop. So, no, no vampire there. Just showing... Yeah, just showing Age of Sigmar stuff. Huh. I swear there was models of them at one point. Yeah, because the Nightwings are available on Forge World. And was there one Vampire, wasn't it? Yeah, it was called the Vampire, the new Vampire. one. Vampire Raider, yeah, because yeah, cause there, there was actually... Um, yeah, there's pictures of them in, uh, what's it, Doom of Mimeria. Yeah, there used to be a model from Doom of Mim- yeah, Vampire one, yeah. They used to be models for them for Forge World. I guess they just stopped making them. Were they model models or just models without rules? Model models. Oh, sorry, rules without models. Oh, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah, that's the vampire, all right. Fair enough. Odd to see it get retired. Yeah, they, like, they, there was actually a link for them, but it's just like they're just taking it from them. That, that was the link for them, um, according to Lexicon sourcing. Um, but yeah, it looks like they just stopped making them. <laughs> <laughs> is that a JoJo reference? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, potentially. <laughs> oh, actually, I found some more models that have been revealed this week. Store anniversary miniatures, including a really, really, really good one. The Inquisitor. I do like that Inquisitor. I really like that Inquisitor model. I mean, it's kind of a Harry Potter reference, stabbing a, a demonic book with a magic sword, but... Oh, that's pretty... I mean, I, I'm, I'm, pre- I'm pretty sure that's been a thing bef- before Harry Potter, in fairness. Oh, yeah, it will be, but that's where, that's where I think I know it from. You need to read more. <laughs> <laughs> You're not too keen on the Auric, though. No, it's it's got some good ideas going on, but it's very... Lackluster. Boring, yeah. Like, it's got a cool vulture, but the vulture could... He could easily be holding the shield and the vulture be perched on it or pointing the spear at something. That would be nice. Uh, but, I, I'm no. still, I'm still not too keen on the gut rippers. Like, they look, no. too, they look far too Tolkien to me. The crew boys, uh, they're not an army that took off. Um... Unlike like the Night Haunt, which I think got quite a good rub out of being the poster army of second edition AOS, the Cruel Boys never really got that um, in terms of they're very un y like compared to the Savage Oryx and the Iron Jaws. They're very different and, yeah, okay, very Tolkien-y. But in general, people just never took to them. And I believe... They are one of those armies that have not sold well on G- by the standards of something that was a, a like a, a new army for the edition. Like if you compared them to 
Death Guard for 8th edition, or if you compare them to Necrons for 9th edition, or Corn Bloodbound, or Nighthaunt, I suspect they would have sold quite poorly by comparison. It also doesn't help that their proportions are very out of whack. Like, you know, let's, how can we forget, you know, you know, boss baby legs, you know, riding his dog? Yeah, not not the best piece of work in terms of uh, proportions and scale, because the arms are longer than the legs. There has been a lot of orc models where the arms have been longer than the legs, basically, like, you know, again, more of like a gorilla esque, you know, build. But because the other orc models were very beefy, they could pull it off. Yeah, like, I'm looking at my orcs now, and obviously, then none of them stand up straight. But I think if I got a ruler and accounted for the corners, I suspect that my orcs might have arms as long as their legs. Yeah, I, I really don't like the crawl boys. No, I mean, I, I've got okay. nothing against the concept, you know, like a, a brand new like type of orcoid that like lives that's evolved for living in swamps. I got no nothing wrong with the concept. It's an interesting concept. It's just in execution, just mm. yeah, they're fine, but they were never going to be the poster child battle. When you think of oh, it's the forces of order arrayed, arrayed against the horde of destruction led by Kragnos, do you think of big, stompy, shouty oryx? Which, considering the Iron Jaws have, like, ten units in their entire book, they would have loved to be expanded at this point. But, no. No, we can't do that. Because who, who are the destruction factions? It's, like, Oryx, Ogors, Gargants. Gargants, Grots. Um, but then there's, there's variations on Grots that also include Squigs and Trogoths and Spiders. Uh, the Oryx have... Three variations. Uh, there's the Sons of Behemoth and the Mega Gargants. The Ogors have two variations in Gutbusters and the Beast Claw Raiders. They've just consolidated them into a very few books. Um, Imagine if they did like an AOS star set that was like Stormcast, Stormcast against um, Beast Claw Raiders. That's the cavalry one. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah, but like, just imagine like the visual dichotomy. You got like, you know, the cleanness and sharpness, and you know, orderliness of you know the Stormcast against like you know, just savage beast riders for destruction. But, but they did that. That's what the Cruel Boys were. They've got ramshackle armor. They've got crude mounts. Yeah, but the and Cruel Boys look like but... shit though. <laughs> yeah, they look. They don't look great. I agree with you. But in terms of what you've said, you're absolutely right. That's what they did. And, like, um, it also give you, like, an, a really nice visual distinction because, like, you're paying inf- infantry against very large cavalry. Like, yeah. very, very large cavalry. Like, hey, we've got some guys riding fucking rhinos and a fucking mastodon. Mm. Yeah, I think the challenge there becomes um, value proposition because you then want players to buy that army. Um, and that is an army that is, uh, like... Ogre, oh, what are they called? Ogre Moor tribes. Most of their battle tome is not Beast Claw Raiders. It's Gutbusters. And most of the models for, or all of the models for Beast Claw are from AOS 8th. The Mournfang, the Stonehorn, Thunder Tusk. Um, some of it's even older, like the Yeti and stuff. They'd have to, I, I wouldn't say no to a redoing and expanding the Ogre range and having Ogres be the big bad. But I think, Rather than making it a cavalry army, because that's a niche to new players, so that they main you want to start new players off with a mix of units, like a bit of infantry, a bit of range, a bit of magic, a bit of priest, a bit of big hero, a bit of everything. I would have said that actually putting them against more tribes would have been better. And then to allow for that size comparison, have them fight the cities of Sigmar instead. Have it be the free guilders against the Ogors. So you get that size and speed dichotomy. Um, and you can still have the fresh pressed suits uh, and, well, not suits, but you know what I mean, of the free guilders and their ranks and regiments against hungry, starving, charging maniacs of the Ogors. I really thought they were going to do a cities uh, starter box this time. I know I was naive to think so, but I think if you're doing like Dawnbringer Crusades and going out into the swamps, it would have been lovely to have cities. Didn't they technically do that when they re-released you know, the Island of Blood box set isn't it, with AOS rules? Um, do you know how many of the models actually survived into AOS? 
Hardly any Zero. Room. Yeah. None of the high elf models made it across. Even though they There's were released n- as part of an AOS box set. Yeah, none of them have survived. Um, the Warden Prince, gone. Swordmasters, gone. Illyrian Reavers, I think, are gone. Um, and the Mage is gone. Um, all of that got rolled up into Lumineth with the uh, Huracan Wind Chargers, the Venari Blade Lords, etc. The Skaven stuff's still around. The Claw Lord, the Clan Rats, the Warp Lock Engineer and stuff, that's still around. But the High Elf stuff, none of it made it into cities. Because when Island of Blood was released, Cities of Sigma was a twinkle in Games Workshop's eye. Hmm. But I think model and news wise, we broadly covered everything by what I by what I can read. Is that no? I thought that was Hero and Blackheart on the cover of White Dwarf this month. Never mind. <laughs> no, so, so it is a red corsair though. Yeah, um, it doesn't appear that they're getting anything special in there. They're just. I think it's just about Flashpoint Narkmund rather than actually being, you know. Index Astartes or equivalent Red Corsairs, which would be really cool, by the way. Uh, oh, but yeah. they haven't done that, it seems. Just, uh, Rem, I apologize. I'm, I have received a message. I have to go, uh, which I think it's actually appropriate, only because I'm not super versed in fantasy, unfortunately, and the Lord of the Rings stuff. Uh, so it was... Yeah, it was fun to be on and talk about the Tau. A bunch of the 40k updates coming out. Super looking forward to trying them out. Would you guys be down to try a game once the rules get kind of more uh, available? Uh, if if time allows and time zones allow, I'm not going to say no to filming a game on t- tabletop sim. Yeah, I'd be fine with that. Oh, it'll be great. I'll get all my code, my crusade people to uh, put a put a list together for me. <laughs> Ye- all right. No, because they'll they'll put together the worst possible list for me and say, yeah, use oh, it. Right. Oh, right. Okay, so they're basically just Twitch chat. Yes. Yes, they are. I love them dearly. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to head off. It was fun, guys. Uh, yeah, everybody, please like, subscribe, uh, help Rem and Tactica out. They uh, they deserve every every ounce of your of your help. Right, thank you very much for joining us, Anchors. And we'll Always appreciate you again. it. Happy New Year and all that, and uh, I'll see you guys later. Bye. Ta da. So, um, have you been reading anything as of late? Um, I have been meaning to start reading Wolf Time. I meant to read it yesterday after I got in from work, but I was so knackered I fell asleep. Um, I can sympathize with being ill. <laughs> I literally went on a 10 minute chat with my Discord server's resident Necron about why I wasn't going to read Twice Dead King alongside you, um, and then never started reading Wolf Time either. So, uh, oops. <laughs> I've not read Wolf Time myself, but um, I don't know if this is true, so take this with a monumental pinch of salt. But apparently it does have information regarding the Space Wolves and the 11th Legion. Allegedly. I don't know if that's true or not, so when you get well, around to reading it, you have to let me know. I uh, Okay, well, there's my motivation to read it. Got it. And I'll be honest, I, I haven't finished Twice Dead King, the first one, yet, because being ill sucks. It makes it really hard to concentrate on doing anything. Um, yep. Yeah, it does. Um, I've read a little bit more, but it's not that much further. Um, Because basically last time we got to, um, you know, our Altics had just unleashed the flayed ones on the orcs. Um, Yeah. So he's watching, you know, know, just watching the flayed ones, you know, beat the ever-loving shit out of the orcs, while his, you know, some minds are basically going, no, I'm not watching this, because, you know, if you look at the flayers too long, you might get infected, you know, because they're all scared of the flayer curse. Mm-hmm. So Altix is like, all right, well, I'm going to head back. He turns around, starts walking off, and he hears like a squishing sound behind him, turns around to look at it, and there's a flayer eating the orc war boss that he's just killed. Well, I say eating, just like smashing meat against its face. Yeah. And the flayer one basically picks up a handful of me and just like offers it to Altix, basically like, hey, you want to join me? And Altix gets so pissed off at that, that he starts beating the ever-loving shit of that flayed one. Like, sl- like smashing it against a nearby statue to pieces. Oof. Um, the ironic thing is that that statue was actually a statue of that flayed one before he contracted the flayer virus, which is ironic. <laughs> um, of course it was. Yeah. 
So I know writers that use subtext and they're all cowards. Um, <laughs> so like after you know the fight, um, Altex basically goes on to um, the command ship in orbit where you know the admiral, his champion, I've forgotten his name, but his nickname is the Razor. So I'm just gonna call him the Razor for simplicity's sake. Mm-hmm. He's basically going to like, why the where the fuck was the Razor? And he's talking to the cryptic who's turned up as well. It's like, uh. I, he's just locked himself away. Apparently, um, why? I th- I think he might be ill, quote unquote. Um, so they go to they go to his room. They bang on the door. The cryptic says, "Hello, this is your friend and physician. Um, why weren't you at the battle?" And Razor says to the door, "Like, oh, just getting ready to launch the assault." It's like the battle was over. Oh, oh, never mind then. It's like. <laughs> Are you okay in there? Because I, no. I'm getting concerned. <laughs> no is the answer to that question. <laughs> um, so p- please, can I come in? You know, I am your friend. Let me, you know, talk to you. So Razor goes, okay. Um, one moment, like sh- weird shuffling sound. You know, opens the door, and Altix is with the cryptic, and Razor didn't realize Altix was there. He's like, oh fuck! Turns away, hides, hides his face, and Altix is like. What's that on your face? Is that blood? How long have you oh, been infected? No. Oh no. <laughs> oh, we all know where this is going and it all ends badly. And apparently he's been infected for decades, but hasn't fully succumbed yet, which is interesting that fact he's been infected for so long and he's not actually succumbed to it. Um, and not infected the entire dynasty while he was at it. And they look inside his room and it's like, hastily hidden behind a pillar is the body of a dead orc and it's like where did that come from it's like oh he must have teleported to the planet grabbed one and came back with a tweet it's like for god's sake um right um why should I not just destroy you now old is basically asking and a cryptid says oh um this is why Uh, we have an even bigger problem on the way and that's where I've gotten to. <laughs> dun dun dun. But yeah, the fact that um, the fact that he's still mostly cognizant, despite you know slowly succumbing to the flare virus, is interesting because it does show that it's not necessarily an instantaneous transformation. Even though in some books, like in Devourer, and um, the flare virus does sometimes have an instantaneous effect. Like, you're infected, bam, you're now a flayer, kind of thing. But on this Necron Lord, he's basically... Well, Admiral, is that Praetor? I don't know what the technical rank would be, Admiral. Um, I don't know what Necron term would be um, in that case, but the fact mm-hmm. it's happening on a such a slow burn... Because um, one of the Cryptex main arguments is like, oh, you can't destroy him. It's like, no, because I'm... Um, do you remember, like, you know, the... You know, the the Bone King in the Ghoul Stars, like, he lives on an entire planet full of flame ones and he's fine. And he's like, oh, everyone knows the Bone King is just a myth. You know? Even though, like, if you read the Necron Codices, you know he's not a myth. He's actually a thing. thing. But I love mm-hmm. the fact that it's, he's basically been relegated to a figure of, like, folklore in Necron terms, so, which is a nice little touch. Yeah, agreed. I think it'll be interesting to see, I obviously... Given that the next one is called Rain uh, rather than Ruin, I suspect that the flayed one, that the Flayer Curse plot thread will be resolved within this book rather than being left as the cliffhanger um, going forward. Though I do wonder what could be an even more serious threat than an existential virus ripping through your own viziers. Um, if I if I had to guess, hey, um, we got a massive Imperial Crusade freak coming. <laughs> that would probably qualify. Yes, that would qualify. Yeah, because that's the honest. Uh, what would be considered a threat by Necron standards? You know, or- orcs are basically just you know at best you know a minor nuisance. Yeah, orc yeah. duty is pest control. <laughs> yeah, the Eldari not they're not big enough to be a threat anymore. But they are dangerous in their small numbers, so it, they are taken seriously. Yes, but they're not. They wouldn't necessarily be, pose a threat to, like, you know, multiple planetary systems. 
Arguably not. Um, Nids, debatable, but it depends on having their worlds actually having some, you know, organic matter really for them to hone in on. I mean, hello, um, orcs. Yeah, true. Um, but that pretty much just leaves the Imperium as being the only major threat, really, for a Necron dynasty. Well, there is chaos, but... Okay, so, so let me rephrase. Humanity. Yes. Uh, that's Yeah, that's more accurate. Yeah. yeah. Huma- but, yeah. Humanity, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's most... I think... I, I feel like I've read somewhere, like on the Black Cover blurb or somewhere, that like there is an Imperial thing involved in the story as well. It's not just orcs and uh, flayers. But I do like the idea of, hey, we've got a flayer outbreak. We need this general to help us fight. But also, he we know he's flare infected, and we know that it's contagious, and we don't know if it, the slow bird has already infected, say, Altix. Mm. Like, especially yeah, since that's... he's come into contact with a flare one by beating the shit out of it. Exactly, it's it's an interesting place to take Necrons in that normally they're the big bad go malfunctioning killbot or fully functioning killbot, depending on how you particularly look at it. Mm. Um, like, for example, in the Mephiston books, they're, uh, or the second one anyway, uh, which has got Necrons as the big bad, uh, the Necron leaders are just fed up with this obsessed Phaeron, um, trying to unlock this thing and then be done with it. Uh, but they're not dealing with an existential problem. They're just chafing under leadership that they don't like because Necrons be ne- Necrons and Necrons be insane. Uh, Not to mention Necrons have a history of, you know, secession. I mean, there's, most of their major historical conflicts were called the Wars of Secession. I mean, yes, several war runs in their blood, or oil, as the case may be. Um, but even in The Infinite and the Divine, the most chafing thing about the Necrons is their societal strictures. That's about it. Like, the way that Trezine and Oricon have to argue in front of a council about ownership rights, um, everything else they do is nothing to do with their an existential crisis to their race. It's just not petty point scoring, but it is basically petty point scoring. That, um, rem- that reminds me, like, um, you know the Eric Andre show? I know its name. I've never watched it. You probably know the meme, like, you're like, hey, look at me, bitch. You know, that meme. You've probably seen it on- online somewhere. But someone basically... Post that and said, This is the infinite and divine in a nutshell. It's like, Hey, Oricon, look at me, bitch. Hey, Trazen, look at me, bitch. <laughs> yeah. It, how, it's, uh, how's, how accurate is that? Not entirely inaccurate. It's like, Hey, I'm going to do this cool thing and one up you. Psych. I'm going to do the cool thing and one up you and I'm going to steal your thing. And I know I'm going to try and usurp you by rewinding time over and over again. And, I mean, whatever else I, I've, I've still not read it the only thing I really know about that book is that um, Trazen gets eaten by a dinosaur he does it, um, it is very good um, having read it it is very good it is funny it is fast paced um, but also does deliver on some interesting lore insights and a real good look at these characters uh, but in terms of does it fundamentally challenge what it is to be a Necron and the Necron race uh, and things that really bother the Necron race. No, it's it's two big two big characters just having a proverbial measuring contest, um, just set over millions of years. Basically, a lover's spat. Uh, I'm not going to ship it, but I suppose you could. Mm. I mean, I'm, yeah. pro- I'm probably not going to read it for a while because I'm still getting through Ruin. I'll probably go straight on to Rain afterwards just because I've, I've got Rain now as well, so I might as well just carry on. Yeah, um, it makes sense. And after that, um, I still got loads of other books I, I need to get through. Like, I still got to do the, the second Blackstone novel, for example. I still got to do the Herisium War trilogy. Um, yeah. You know, still got to do um, Rebirth, um, Indomitus, you know. Um, yeah, I, I've I, got... I still got to do the R2 Dawn of Fire books as well. Yeah, I, I think in terms of the show, I'll focus on Dawn of Fire and let you do Siege of Terror. Obviously, I know you want to read them on your own time, so you've got them for your videos and things like that. Um, but I think I'm going to look at getting Wolf Time done. Then I think I'll try and read 
Volpo and Glory, uh, the Blue Bloods novel, um, because I bought that in the same uh, pack when I bought in the same order. Um, and I also bought um, Ghoul Slayer, uh, the Go Trick and Felix book. I bought that as well. That reminds me, I've also got to do the Erdish novels as well. Oh, yeah, those. Yeah, like Serpent and the Saint and the uh, Magister and the Martyr. Yeah, the Iron Snake stuff. Yeah. Those came out relatively quick from one another as well, actually, thinking about it. Because, like, with, with Twice Day King books, like, they came over like three months of each other. It was like something similar with the Erdish books as well, in fairness. Mm. They, they do some, some books take ages to get a sequel and some just come out super quick mm. I'm still generally surprised we've we've suddenly got a massive influx of Sabat War stuff I mean with Dad Abnett coming back to it when he did the, the Gaunt's Ghost book um, it may be that GW were looking to capitalise on that by having a few, a few Sabat adjacent mm. things going on at the same time to capitalise I guess yeah because people would read that, would want to read the Gaunt's Ghost novel, or had read the old ones, so read it. Thus, they're re-engaged in the Sabat Crusade as a concept, and thus, if they've got more new literature around it, then they're already interested, so they want to stick around and read that as well, maybe. Mm. I can see that. But, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting, definitely. Uh, and I'm not complaining. It's not an area I know very well as a series, uh, the Sabbath worlds, but it's it's good that they're going back to it. Yeah, I still also got to read through the um, the Red Gobbo novella as well. Oh yeah, I know the one. I've also got to do yeah. the Silver Templars one as well. Yeah, I might try and look at um, what was the Black Library pre-order this week. I'm going to remind myself now. Uh, the Black Library pre-order this week, I think, was just Harrow Deep. Um, the end of enlightenment in paperback, but I already own that in hardback. Um, so yeah, because yeah. um, in February we got Kragnos. Um, later on oh, this month yeah. we got Triumph of Saint Catherine and Day of Ascension and Krieg. Uh, February we got the successor chapter anthology, um, Storath, which was me, um, Sigismund, and Gothgul Hollow. Yeah, uh, Go Trek, Kragnos, yeah, St. Catherine. I do want to read Day of Ascension, actually. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, I've not read any of Adrian Tchaikovsky's works, but, like, he's, like, a hugely acclaimed sci-fi writer, so... Yeah, it'd be interesting I have actually bought... I was going to say, it'd be interesting to see how he handles um, 40k. Yeah, I have bought Children of Time, um, so I might try and read that if I get a chance. Um, yeah, the Sigismund book. Yeah, th- there is a lot to read coming soon. So I may try, if I can stay organized, then getting Kragnos and Day of Ascension and probably, maybe, probably not Sigismund because it's a limited edition. I'll never get a chance to get it because I don't have agents um, or organization either. Don't, um, don't worry, I'll, I'll read that one. <laughs> yeah, um, possibly Krieg, but I've never been that interested in Krieg as a faction. I know, Heresy. Uh, uh, um, I, I'll be honest, like, one thing that bothers me about the Krieg is just how overly memed they become. It just kind of puts me off. Mm. I mean, don't get me wrong, I've got, I got no issue of people making you know, Krieg jokes and Krieg memes and all that. It just shows how, how, how popular they are in the fandom. It's just like... Uh, it's just mm, just leaves a little bit of like a just yeah kills your interest in my case like it's part of the reason like why I've not been so you know eager to read the infinite time because everyone's been going on about it it's just made me think like eh, kind of thing <laughs> yeah I don't want to sound like a contrarian or anything like that but it's like everyone's hyping it up so much that it's just making you think it's it can't be it's not going to be as good as everyone's making out to be kind of thing you know what I mean no, I do. Um, it's part of the reason I read AOS fiction is because not as many people in the general sphere talk about it. I know people do, um, like have book clubs and things like that where they discuss AOS literature, 
but one of the things that I feel like we do when we do this book segment, where we talk about novels that we've been reading, is partly to help advise people in terms of what they should or shouldn't be reading in terms of quality, um, but also to try and introduce them to new ideas and concepts. That's what makes, like, for example, Twice Dead King or something like that so interesting is that there's interesting things being played with there that you might want to spend your money on, but you don't know. So you listen to people like us talk about it. And that's why I read the Sigmar fiction. Like, I know most people here are 40k people, especially on your channel, are 40k viewers. I accept that. But there's a whole other game out there and the literature for it is blooming brilliant. Court of the Blind King, Scourge of Fate, Realm Lords, End of Enlightenment. Like, this, that's literally what I've seen looking at my bookshelf. That's not me thinking about it. That's just looking at my bookshelf of really I good AOS something. literature. I just realised something. Mm-hmm. Um, the Gotrek series is actually Black Library's longest running series. It probably is. Because when Black Library themselves just like at start as like a separate publishing company, like one of the first novels that came out was Troll Slayer, the first Go Trek and Felix book. And what year was that? Ninety eight, I think. So that means that Go Trek's been going for twenty three years, two different universes. And then look, Troll Slayer that came out oh August nineteen ninety nine. Oh yeah, because it recently had um the twenty year anniversary book, didn't it? That'd have been two, three years ago by now. Yeah, because we had, like, there was, like, th four of those 20th anniversary books. There was one for um, First and Only, Space Wolf, 13th Legion, and Troll Slayer. Yeah, because the first one that came out was Space Wolf. Mm -hmm. And then I think it was Troll Slayer, and then First and Only, and then 13th Legion. I think. I I I I was like two or three years old. I have no way of. Let me double check with for. Uh, first learning was 1999. Yes, it's like same year. Okay, August 1999 for. Oh, they came out in the same month. Yeah. Right. So. So technically, Gaunt's Go Gaunt's Ghosts and Go Trick are both the longest running novel series by Back Library. It's an impressive feat for both of them. In fairness. Agreed, but, but, I, th but I think that, I think Gotrek's actually had more books come out in the interim. I mean, Gotrek has had three AOS, just AOS books. There was Realm Slayer, Ghoul Slayer, and now Git Slayer. There's been three just for AOS in the f admittedly six years that AOS has been around. Yeah, because Gotrek, um, how many novels of Gotrek? Uh, there was Troll Slayer, Skaven Slayer, Demon Slayer, uh, Dragon Slayer, Beast Slayer, Vampire Slayer, so that's six. Yeah, uh, Elf Slayer, Dragon Slayer, I'd assume. Hang on. Dragon Slayer, Beast... Oh, Dragon, I've done those. Oh. Um, Dragon Slayer was number six. Yeah. Giant Slayer, Orc Slayer, Man Slayer, so that's nine. Elf Slayer, Shaman Slayer, Zombie Slayer, that's twelve. 12. Um, the Serpent Queen, which is the only one that doesn't have Slayer in it. Um, so that's just Warhammer, that's just the Warhammer Fantasy ones looks like no, there's going to be more than that isn't it? that's 13 plus any shorts that have not been counted because Black Lobby has an actual series tab doesn't it this might actually be better just going there so Dawn of Fun Vell Sigeta Inferno well bring up Gaunt's Ghost in our tab so I can just check that right because if it doesn't have Go Trek in the series section on Black Library, I just wonder what the fuck are they doing? There you go, Go Trek and Fix. Right, let's have a look. Um, right, so Beast Slayer, Git Slayer, Troll Slayer, Ghoul Slayer, Realm Slayer. There's, there's 41 things listed on the website. Um, no, not all of those are separate. Some of them will be omnibuses and things. Sl so we have, so we have what? We had thirteen on previously I mentioned. So on top of that, we had um, the lot. Yeah, we said Serpent Queen, Kinslayer, the Lost Tales, Slayer, which is like them and Bellacor, which I think were the last ones. I think, yeah, they were the last ones. And then you had Realm Slayer, Git Slayer, Ghoul Slayer. 
Yeah, and in so on like 13, top of that, 14, 15, been, 16, 18. That's at least that's at least eighteen books. Plus, he's been in shorts in one, two, three, four. Technically, five. That that's about his elf companion. Yeah, there's five separate shorts in AOS that surround Gotrek as well. Oh, and City of the Damned. We didn't mention City of the Damned. Or did we? Hang on, I'm just try- trying to count up all the Gaunt's go- Ghost ones. Yeah, there's Into the Valley of Death, Gotrek and Felix Myths and Legends, The Reckoning, Birthhold's Beard, Road of Skulls. Uh, yeah, obviously the Slayer books are a series unto themselves, but there's so many shorts. There's 41 different things listed, mind you. One, two, three, four, five of those are audio dramas, but still, it's like 30 different separate properties. And for Gorn's Ghost, like, on the actual Black Library thing, there's like 38 things, but that's also including short stories and audio dramas and that as well. Yeah. So yeah, I, th- I think we have to give the edge to Go Trek and Felix it's just because like it's been going since August 1999 and it's had more shit put out than Gorn's Ghost so hmm and it's obviously had more authors as well because it's changed hands a few times from Bill King David, uh, David Geimer, Geimer and, Darius and Hinks. now Darius Hinks yeah. yeah it's changed hands a few times along the way whereas um, Go- whereas, uh, so Gorn's Ghost has always been Dan Abner so uh Nathan Long wrote Elf Slayer and Orc Slayer and stuff, so there's another author in there. Oh, so, there's, so there's four different Gotrek and Felix authors. Four Gotrek and Felix and one Gaunt Ghost. And one Brian Blessed. The angriest dwarf that ever dwarfed. <laughs> exactly. But let's not forget, like, Gotrek was a slayer who was so incompetent at his job that not even the apocalypse could kill him. That's how incompetent yeah, it's like, he was. <laughs> Yeah, your one job was to die. How are you not dying? It's uh, it's. I'm, it's, I'm still it's, waiting for the book where he goes up to meet with Thankor. It's like Thankor, you're the only person I know in this timeline. <laughs> yeah. Was like, we need. Why? To- why are we still here? <laughs> Meanwhile, Thankor's busy counting all the peanuts. Like, they like they scream the magic of the mushrooms because he's gone completely mad. He has. Uh. Actually, is anyone who else has survived apart from you know those who have become gods? Who has the Mortarks? Uh, so Neferata, Manfred, uh, and Ark in the Black. Though they were already dead, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sigvald's made it across. Has he? Um, yep. Yeah, Sigvald is now. Uh, well, he was imprisoned in a shield for a long time, but uh, he's back. I, do you know? I, I don't know why, but I, I, I was thinking of Valton, and I don't know why. <laughs> it's because um, Sig Sigmas Val yeah yeah um, a lot of chaos it's mostly been chaos and death that have made it across um, okay, so, so so who from non-chaos or death factions as nobody yeah apart from Thankwall uh, who's chaos yeah Skaven a part of Grand Alliance chaos so it's they just Gotrek so for order it's just Gotrek and the gods um, like Marathi, Malerian, Teclis. Mind you, Marathi wasn't a god at the time, but you know what I mean. Uh, on the on the order side, the only non-god that's made it across in a most in a literal sense is Gotrek. Um, Destruction has nobody, uh, none of the Ogors, none of the Oryx, um, none of the Gobos, uh, and then Didn't Chaos Gorgos has all the demons plus Valkyrie made it across. Um, Sigvald made it across. There is still a Cursling, but it's not Village, oh. so that doesn't count. Well, t- well, technically, we could say Croak. Oh, okay, yeah, Croak. Yep, 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 Croak. You're right, Croak. Yeah, so I'm just going like, okay, so who who survived? Okay, well, Sigmar, Tyrion, Teclis, Malekith, Marathi, Nagash, Shalario, Grimnir, Grungi, Gork and Mork, the Skaven as a whole, the Lizardmen as a whole. Croak, and therefore Croak, yeah. Croak, Manfred, Arkin, Neferata, the Glotkin, the Magathriders, Archeon, Scar, Bloodwrath, Valkyrie the Bloody, Sila and Fingrim, and Gotrek. And Sigvald. And Thankwall. 
but then he's included, <laughs> he's included under the Skaven, apparently. Yeah, um, but yeah, it's it's interesting that how oh wasn't there that Beastman character like who ended up ascending to godhood as well? Uh, the one basically who like, ended up like mutating everything. Forgotten his name. I mean, that sounds like uh, Malachor, uh, the great Bray Shaman. Uh, I don't know if it's Malachor, but um, Malachor. I don't... Malachor, I was close. I don't believe so. The Beast of Chaos book makes no mention of him. No, I don't think it was Malachor. Was it Malachor? It might have been someone uh, else, actually. I can't think of... There was Gore, like Warhoof or whatever his name is, but the Beast Chariots didn't make it across. Because uh, there was one like, in one of the chaos where he is actually mentioned by name. Uh, right, I'm just going to do a quick Google Beast Man. Might have been Morgul. Heroes. Uh, Kazrak One Eye, Morgul, the Shadow Gave, yeah, Malagor, think, the yeah, Dark the cor- the Morgul the Corrupter, yeah. Yeah, it was Morgul, yeah. Huh. I had absolutely no idea they'd made it across. Yeah, because I remember. Um, in the TTS chat, um, Gara actually mentioned, I posted something saying that Morgul was actually mentioned by name. Yeah, according to the a- Age of Sigma wiki, Morgul is now a minor chaos god who spreads disorder and corruption. He is venerated by the Gave Spawn Great Fae. Ah, uh, yes, yes, that's the great phrase, yeah. Oh, yeah. God, that model is awful. <laughs> But yeah, it's yeah. like, hey, at least, you know, a Chaos character ended up ascending to Godhood, so... Yeah, I mean, Archeon tried, Archeon failed. Um, well, no, he didn't. Archeon is not Abaddon. But, uh... Yet. Yet. <laughs> but, yeah, like, but, but the fact the fact that like, a Beastman character, of all things, ended up becoming a Chaos God. Fair play, I mean, to, fair play to the man. Yeah. Or fair I play mean, to the, the Beastman, rather. Yeah, if you could even call it that by the end. But yeah, it, it's interesting that seeing how everyone thought that it was this hard reset, everything's dead, um, or oh look, it's just the same thing but with a, with a new coat of paint. Look at all the fan service, and it's kind of ended up that most armies stand alone, but there's just enough callbacks if you know what you're looking for. Like yeah. the Lumineth are all new, but here's Teclis. The Daughters of Cain are almost all new. If you knew your Dark Elf, if you didn't know Dark Elves, but here's Marathi. Oh, and by the way, here's Tyrion and Teclis in the background. Here's Sigmar in the background. It's, it's uh, yeah, a there good was also balance. that thing. Um, there was also that thing for the Gloom Spite as well when I mentioned like, oh, with Bad Moon. Oh yeah, there's this one meteor keeps going around. Uh, they say that he was a, a grot wall that ruled over eight mountain peaks. Wink, wink. Yes, hello, Scar Snake. Say hi. <laughs> But yeah, it's it's a nice place where I, as a, someone who knew fantasy tangentially, have a few moments of, I understood that reference, but the law stands alone on its own without you needing to understand oh, fantasy yeah. for it to be good, which is an important thing for it to do. Absolutely. Um, do we have any time for questions? I don't know if we've been going on for nearly two hours. Uh, we've got five, ten minutes. I think we can do a few if there's any going around. Okay. Um, someone actually followed up on the whole Wolves on Fenris thing, by the way. Um, Fair enough. It was in the Lucas the Trickster novel they talk about it. I completely forgot about that plot point in the Lucas Trickster novel, but it's been so long since so, I read it, to be honest. La- so it says here, Lady Malice is chatting with Duke Sliscus, and it's there that he mentions that his homunculi found traces of human DNA within the flesh of the wolves that they had killed. I mean, as, uh, it's been so long since I read that novel. I think that's when we had yeah. like, Josh, like Josh Reynolds was on the show. Yes, it was around that time. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, someone just followed it up because we weren't sure. Um, so Thank a couple of people, there's, there's, there's two separate comments about it. Yeah. Uh, do, 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 do. Question. Are custodes immune to corruption? Apparently so, if the uh, Siege of Terran was ready for to go by. Because there was that scene like they end up fighting against demons, and that each one was like giving off like a glowing anti demon aura kind of thing. But and like, yet. but then there's also that weird thing in the Black Legion codex from Seventh Edition, which seems to be tied into um that thing from Master of Mankind. You know, when Ra and Dimian got impaled with Dragnian, and the Empress said, "Run," and yeah. uh, and Dragnian said like. 
like, oh, well, it'd take long to corrupt a custodian than it would to, like, burn out all the stars in the galaxy. But then again, you know, having a demon blade literally lodged inside them, that's going to do something. And in that Black Legion Codex, um, when Draconian was taken to its hiding spot, there was a golden spirit which led Abaddon directly to Draconian, and it seems to be implied that that is actually the spirit of Rar and Dimian. So you got to wonder why the fuck is Rar and Dimian lead? If that is Rar and Dimian, why the fuck is a custodian spirit leading Abaddon to you know the end of empires? Uh, because he thought it would kill him. I don't know. I'm trying to find. I don't know why I'm looking for it, but I thought I had stored on my USB somewhere the um, the old one of the old heresy books, book seven, because. During the scouring of Prospero, uh, the Sisters of Silence provide the anti balls and the custodians outside of them were going down hard. And I'm trying to remember if they were being mutated in the process, but I can't find the book, which is irritating. Because none of those folders seem to be what I thought they were. That is irritating. I thought I had that folder where I had a bunch of um, ebooks that somebody gave me. Never mind. Right. Uh, do, 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 do. Since two gene stealer cults have emerged on Terra, could a chaos cult emerge and survive on Terra in a similar way? At this point, I wouldn't be bloody surprised. I mean, if. It- if two gene stealer cults and a Drukari homunculus or an entire army of grotesques can get away unnoticed, I'm sure a chaos cult can as well at some point. Let's be bluntly honest. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because like, if they can get away with all that, he makes me wonder. Like, well, clearly security on Terra is a lot more lax than we give it credit for. And we don't give it much credit to begin with. <laughs> no. I mean, do you remember that time when orcs actually end up walking into the Imperial Bears going, Sup? Or that time that the Eldari made it to the throne room. That one Harlequin ended up butchering her way through a bunch of custodians. Yep. And people say, like, oh, it's it's not realistic for our custodians to be pulled down by gene seers. No, but it's realistic for them to be butchered by one Harlequin. And not even a solitaire. <laughs> If it was a solitaire, that'd be a different name altogether, because like, solitaires oh, are badasses. Yeah. Oh, yeah, solitaires, I could believe, could mow through an army of custodians without much stopping for breath. I mean, do you remember that story that I had, like, a, a solitaire fighting off against an Aversa assassin? Did it win? It was basically, because the solitaire was trying to kill a planetary governor, an Aversa assassin was dispatched to kill the solitaire, and the solitaire and these first were fighting... And then the solitaire led the Aversa to where the planetary governor was, killed the Aversa to make it blow up, so it blew up planetary governor. So, yeah, solitaire wins long. <laughs> it's like, uh, like it's 110 IQ there. <laughs> agreed. Um, on episode... Th- oh, don't make this the last one, I think, because we haven't got a lot of time. This might take a while to answer. On episode 56, I know it's a long time ago, the ADB episode, there was a question on whether the belief that the Emperor is a god helps the Emperor in any way, or instead creates a dark reflection of him in the warp, and ADB responded that it probably does both. If that is the case, does that mean that things like the Grey Knights have to, in some way, repress the dark reflection of the Emperor from time to time? And if so, does that put the Emperor in harm's way? Oh, that's an interesting one. That's a very yeah. interesting one, and I don't know if we have enough time to actually go through all the nuance in that. <laughs> Which is a shame. Yeah, like, I mean, obviously, we're, we're building off of, of a answer that ADB gave, so it's one of those where you kind of need to go ask Aaron. Um, but I mean, it's possible, but at the same time, you need to ask, would the Grey Knights even know about the dark reflection of the Emperor being created? Maybe not. Would they be... Because, yeah, they have a knowledge on demons, but they're not omniscient. Nope. They make mistakes. I mean, let's be honest with you. Everyone's made fucking mistakes. Like, 
Like, hey, oh no, we might become corrupted by chaos, so we need to kill some sisters of battle and paint our armor in their blood. No, we're Lol. never going to forget that. That was stupid. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that one's, uh, yeah. And it, that was, one's never it was go almost away. as stupid as that one bit of lore, like, oh, a single hell brute wiped out an entire Sister Bell convent. What? And let us never forget the ultimate meme answer to any 40k question. Heretical load-bearing walls. <laughs> but yes, um, in terms of a short answer to the question, no, probably not, because they would have no idea it was there. Um, and if a chaos, because bear in mind, it's a, if it were a dark reflection of the emperor and the emperor was a god, it would be a chaos god. So there is absolutely no way that the Grey Knights could, you know, repress the power of a chaos god. They can't. They, 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 they can't. They could barely keep a greater demon or a demon primarch in check with a hundred of them. They're not going to stand a chance against the chaos god. I mean, we're going to do is look at that story, you know, the Silver Knight of Slaanesh, you know? Also, Angron Say Hi, where it killed an entire brotherhood in one go. No, not an entire one. It was like three of them survived. It was 97% casualties. <laughs> by Imperial by that. standards, that's, that's, you know, a great success. I mean, by Imperial Guard standards, that's a great success. By Grey Knight standards, that's is that, a success, but is it, not a great one. <laughs> okay, and I can't find By standards of facing off against a demon Primarch. Taken. Point very much taken. Um, yeah. Uh, was that the one where the guy, like, caught and shattered the Black Blade with his pure psychic power? Because I, I feel like it was. It was in The Emperor's sure. Gift. It, it was The Emperor's Gift, was the novel. It might have been, I don't know. Um, I know um, the incident was basically like, it was First War of Armageddon, and, yeah. like, Angron was like, aha, I'm going to beat the show. And Logan Grimnar went, aha, I play my trap card, 100 Grey Knights, bang! <laughs> Yeah, and they completely traded one for one. Angron was banished for a thousand years and the Grey Knights lost an in, almost an entire brotherhood because of one bloke's plot armor. I thought it was for a hundred years in a day. Or was it a hundred, not a thousand? Yeah, because Angron then came back at the end of the th during the third war for Armageddon until that got stopped. So, yeah. It he was banished for X amount of years and a day, which seems very arbitrary. So we're going to banish you for this amount of time and a day just out of spite. Yeah, just so you don't make it. Just so we can't set your calendars by Angron invasions, we're going to add an extra day. Because why not? Because why not? I mean, there are a fair few other questions we could talk about, but uh, I suspect we're already at just under two hours. So I think, I think it's probably best because we started a little late as well. Um, so I think we should probably call it there. Because yeah. I don't know about you, Ram, but I'm hungry. <laughs> um, I wish I could have a fucking appetite these days, but yes. Um, anyway, um, on, on that bombshell, thank you very much for joining us this episode. We hope you enjoyed it. And we want to give enough thanks to Super Anchors for joining us as well, even though he had to up out early, but these things happen. Um, yeah, I would, I would do a... You're very... W I can't do the Dawn voice, or I would do an impression just as if he was still actually here, but I'm not going to try. I dare you. No. I dare you. <laughs> no. Do it. No. That's the best you're getting. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best you're getting. <laughs> so, until next time, this has been Remnants from 40k Theories. And this has been Tatsuka Imperialis. And we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.